Welcome to the Finding Career Zen podcast. I'm your host, Pete Newsom, and my guest today is Rebecca Gill. Rebecca began her career as an accountant, but transitioned to technology sales and marketing executive, to entrepreneur as the founder of a successful digital marketing agency, to international speaker, and now to alpaca farmer. <laughs> Needless to say, Rebecca Gill is one of a kind. During her career, she supported organizations of all sizes, from those with a specialized niche to the Fortune 500, and her work has been recognized by GoDaddy, Ahrefs, HubSpot, Wired Magazine, and many other top brands. Currently, Rebecca balances her time between taking on select clients as a highly sought-after SEO consultant while running a physical and online retail store selling all things alpaca to being a wife, a mom, and of course, actually having to take care of those 50 alpacas. So with all that said, Rebecca, how, how in the heck did you have time to do this today? You just got to make priorities. And I almost had to bump you for babies come in in alpaca land, but the good news is I didn't have to. So here we are today. So you mentioned that to me the other day. You did give me a warning that at any given moment, you may have to disappear to take care of, of birthing an alpaca or two or three, I think. Right Correct. Now. Three are currently due on the farm. Yes. Wonderful. Well, I, I want to talk about how you actually got there. But before that, and before we even get to the success you've had throughout your career, I do want to uh, just spend a couple of minutes on on what you know I understand um, from previous conversations to be what anyone could s consider to be humble beginnings. You did not have the easiest of paths to success, and and a fairy tale ending was far from a given. <laughs> so do you mind do you mind spending a few minutes on that? No, not at all. Yeah. So um, I grew up in Northern Michigan. Um, my early childhood years were spent with my parents. Um, my mom had multiple sclerosis and also had multiple personalities. She was, she was a little, uh, little mentally unbalanced. And at age 11, I proactively became a ward of the state and moved in with my grandparents and my aunt at different times. I lived, you know, between them um, and started, you know, kind of a much different path. And it was like my very first pivot in life. Um, but it taught me a lot of things. You know, when you grow up on public assistance and you grow up in a small town uh, with just a lot of kind of chaos around you, uh, you learn to be very self-sufficient and you learn to be a hard worker and to rely on yourself. And, um, and I say that, but it was also definitely a village that raised me in my little small town, my graduation class of like a hundred there were lots and lots of people who subtly were making efforts to help me along the way, whether it was giving me a part-time job at 11 at Ben Franklin or helping me fill out you know, free lunch program applications or even financial aid forms for college. So, because I didn't really have parents to do that kind of stuff for me. And it became everybody else's parents in the town that would kind of just you know, scoop me up and help me along the way, which was amazing. So clearly those experiences shaped who you've become, mm -hmm. but do, do you, when you're looking back at, you know, a lot of people in that situation, well, you're going to go one of two ways. You're going to go down the wrong path because you know, everything um, on, on the path to success is, is very sharply uphill. Uh, so, so that's the much harder path. Um, what, what enabled you to go down there? I mean, have, I'm sure you've thought about it over the years. Looking back, do you, you know, is there anything that comes to mind? Was it just, you know, intestinal fortitude, who you are, or was, was there other, are there other influences that you can, you can point to? I've always said that everything good in me came from my grandmother. And I think she laid the groundwork for that, even though she didn't have a ton of time to allocate to raising me. Um, she did teach me fundamentals of life just doesn't happen for you. <laughs> like if you want something, you need to work hard for it. I mean, she would tell me stories about when she grew up, she was a teenager in the depression and her mother looked at her and said, you know, I can't afford to feed you. So you have one of two options, go find a job or go get married. And she married my grandfather who she never loved and was married to him for like 50 years. And how, how, really you know, didn't like him, but like there was, those were the kind of the lessons that she was very frank with me about. Um, and just kind of knowing like the world in which I was living, she, you know, I was already kind of an adult in a child body and she treated me like that. And just, you know, it, it was like, no one's going to hand you anything, like go work for it. 
you know, make your own opportunities and don't expect the world to just hand you things on a silver platter because it's never going to happen. You won't be happy. And that was what she taught me. And, you know, I took that, you know, kind of forward with me. But I will tell you, it's like early childhood jobs, like at McDonald's taught me a lot too, of just, you know, if you want to, if you want something and you want good in your life, you've got to work hard to get it. And I feel like that is been fundamentally, you know, part of my core since, you know, being 11 or 12 or whatever the years were when I started actually working. So 11 years old, you said you proactively made the decision uh, to leave. Yes. I'm, I'm thinking of my kids when they were 11, they certainly weren't in that mode or mindset, and I'm not sure they would even know where to begin. So um, that's terrifying to, to, th well, to think about. And it wasn't that like I, when I say proactively, um, I was having a, like literally a breakdown at my house when I was 11. I just was mentally decomposing. And I went up for Christmas with my grandparents to my aunt's house and I didn't want, I was, when it came time for me to leave, I was breaking down again. And they said, you know, you can stay. So I called home on Christmas morning and told my parents I wasn't coming home. My parents were like, oh yes, you are. And I was like, oh no, I'm not. And I wasn't. And then it, you know, went from there where I had to literally go to court, sit in front of my dad inside the courtroom and say, I don't want to live with you. I don't want to come home. Like, it's not a good environment for me. I'm making the choice to stay up here, whether whoever I live with, that's my choice. Um, and it was, it's like a sense of survival, right? Like I knew I couldn't go back. I knew it was very chaotic. Um, my parents were also, by the way, in a cult at that when I was young and my mom was very embedded in the cult. And there was just so much chaos that it was feel like you can't survive in that environment or force with everything yet you can to go into a new one that seems at the time healthier. And it was. So the odds you know, I want to say they were stacked against you early <laughs> on, but yes, but yeah, there's something to be said as I've heard others speak of, of their success and the adversity that they had to deal with. I think, um, you know, while you wouldn't wish this upon anyone and you wouldn't wish this for yourself to some degree, it has to have shaped you for the better as, as life has gone on it certainly oh, prepared absolutely. You for life in, in, in a harsh way, but an effective way. It, absolutely. And I've tried to, like, I would never want this for my own two children, but I've also taken what I've learned and taught that to them, right? Like, don't expect, I'm not handing you everything. Here's the scope of your college fund. Here's the scope of what your expectations, your expectations are, uh, you know, and, and so that they can transfer a little bit of that over to help them without having them kind of go through the angst that I did. Um, I wouldn't, like you said, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I also looking back and feel very fortunate that I had those early experiences because it helped prepare me for my life I have today, which is really good. Yeah. I, I think, um, how you're socialized, you know, without <laughs> your choice is, is yeah. a huge factor, right? There's what you have potential, um, to become, but also what your environment has helped dictate. Um, or, or hurt in some cases, mm -hmm. how much of that has been a factor on your parenting where I, I think it's a somewhat common theme to uh, be inclined to give your kids the life that you wanted and didn't get to have, but also struggling with uh, the thought that that may not be what's best for them in the long term. H has that been you know, a battle you've had to, to fight with yourself as a parent? It's the, well, so, you know, when, as my kids are growing up, everybody was a helicopter parent and it was that don't be, you know, don't fall into that trap because you don't want your kids like, you know, to have that. I want them to be self-sufficient. I want them, if I were to disappear at any point, they to be physically, mentally capable of going forward and not feeling shattered. And if I was a helicopter parent, they wouldn't have those, you know, that ability, nor would they have the skill sets that they need when they leave the house and go on to college or have a job. And so those were kind of like the boundaries that we set, you know, I made sure they had all of that security, all of the, you know, warm place to live and food on your plate and things that I worried about as a kid, but then also refused to helicopter parent them. I, to, and to this day, I say that I'm like, I, my son said to me one day recently, 16, he's like, did you sign me up for driver's training? 
No, I did not. <laughs> if you're old enough and mature enough to drive, you're old enough and mature enough to sign yourself up for driver's training. And those are the things that I do try to kind of push forward from my childhood because I want them to be self-sufficient and successful and happy with their ability to care for themselves in all, you know, in all ways. I, I, you, you keyed on a word that I've been thinking about a lot um, as I've started this new podcast and, and talking with people who are either on the road to being successful or have already re- achieved success is it, happiness, right? Like yeah. it, it, it means something different to every person, but that sort of is the ultimate goal, I think. Um, yeah, as you're talking, I'm thinking of a quote that I don't know if it was attributed to Confucius or it was just a, a Chinese um, you know, saying that's been around and no one really is sure where it originated. But the, I've thought about it a lot as a parent, and I don't know that I've always followed this advice, but uh, it's you know, the goal should be to prepare your child for the path, not the path for the child. And it's such a perfect way to describe helicopter parenting. And uh, we both probably have many, many examples we could point to of where we've seen it and the harm that it can do over time. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, even even to this day, like last weekend, and I haven't told you this, I had a mom come in with two children to my farm store wanting me to hire her kids and was helicopter parenting the entire time. (laughs) And I just kind of looked at her and I'm thinking to myself, your kids can't even speak because you're speaking for them. How am I supposed to hire them? I mean, you know, and that's it. And I'm the anti of that, you know, and I I have a a industry friend and she said she had a very similar childhood to mine. She said her parents, her kids would have referred to her as the UFO because she was the, if she came in and swooped in, she was the unidentified flying object. They were like, wait a minute, who's that? Because she also, same as me, wanted her kids to be sufficient and, you know, feel secure and be able to, to man for themselves, take care of themselves even though we can be there to help them, you know, it's, it's you know, kind of that decision of setting them up for success and happiness um, and not reliant, not, not making their happiness and their success reliant on somebody else. I think that's the biggest thing, you know, we want our children to be happy, but I want them to be able to, to forge that themselves and find their own happiness as opposed to me kind of shoving it down their throat. Well, I, I think, I don't know that you could be genuinely happy without some sense of accomplishment along the way and knowing that you've achieved it for yourself in if we look at so many examples of the most successful people out there having kids that are just absolute train wrecks you know sometimes very publicly um you know it sort of all ties in together is that you you can hand someone everything but it's not gonna buy happiness right it really does need to be achieved so with so let's go back to your 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 11 year old job what what was that What, what did you do so the family across from my aunt in my little dinky town were the wealthiest people in town and they owned multiple stores and the, the dad was also a lawyer in town on the bank board and everything. Well, one of their stores was a Ben Franklin. And when the daughters, which were my friends, would have like family in town or could not work in the store, I was paid, I think, $2 an hour to go work with the mom and make sure that nobody stole anything. You were the enforcer. I was the enforcer, like just kind of milling around the store and, you know what I mean? And I put things back and, you know, which was great because it it, like, it gave me extra, it gave me money. I didn't have any money. So it gave me money um, and it gave me something to do and it gave me some purpose. And it just, the other thing it did was it showed me that an adult had confidence in me, right. That carried me had confidence in me, which was really critical at that point in my life. And I don't, I don't know if she, you know, they have any clue, but I did go back in later years and thank them. I was back in the town. I walked into the store and I was like, you know what? I just want to thank you for being there for me as a kid. And, um, and I've, and they're one of their, their cousins, that my friend's cousins was in my graduating class. And in my 20 year reunion, I remember telling him how instrumental his aunt and uncle were in my life. And he could not believe it because he didn't have that relationship with them. And I was like, they took care of me in many ways that, you know, you just didn't know. Wow. Good for them. That, mm-hmm. and, and good for you that you had someone, someone to do that. I think uh, you know, kids, 
you know, I, I'm a youth sports coach. Um, oh, I say that having just coached my last basketball game for my eighth grader who will be now in high school. So I'm hanging up the whistle, but, uh, for, for years with all my kids I've coached. And one of the philosophies I've always had is, and really has been you know, proven by my own experiences and until someone convinces me otherwise, I'll continue to believe that kids and people genuine generally rise to the, you know, the bar that's been set for them. And so if your expert expectations are high, in your case, you're given a responsibility at a young age that most people wouldn't give to someone um, who was 11, it, it's impactful. It's meaningful. Mm-hmm. And you made probably, I'm sure you didn't realize it or acknowledge that feeling at the time, but you, you probably didn't want to disappoint them and, and that you were going oh, to figure no. out how to get the job done. No, and I'm an introvert. So like, you know, take an 11 year old introvert that is really mentally unstable and stick them in a store now. And they're supposed to, you know, go and do things like that. But it it took me outside of my comfort level. And, you know, like you're saying with with coaching, the, the saying in our house with our kids is don't race to the bottom. Like, I don't expect you to be the top of the top, but do not set your expectations so that you're racing to the bottom. Like just because Jimmy's getting a C in Spanish doesn't mean that that's your, that's your bar. Right. Right. You know, move, well, move your bar ahead and, it, you know, find your own hit level of happiness and, and comfort, but definitely don't be pushing that towards the bottom. Well, it's you know, when you take all these things into, into consideration together, happiness, while perhaps the ultimate goal isn't, going to be given or shouldn't have to be given along the way, right? You, you, you mentioned comfort level. Well, you, you have to be uncomfortable a lot of times to evolve and grow and change. And um, I think this probably goes without saying, but I, I would expect you would you know, consider a lot of your lessons that you've learned where you've improved or successes that you've had. Um, you, know, you could probably draw a pretty um, direct line to a failure or frustration or a challenge that you didn't want, but encountered in order to achieve that, um, that uh, evolution. Absolutely. Especially being a female in tech or being a female in automotive, which I worked for, for a while, which was a very male dominated environment that, you know, many generations, you know, people were coming, it's like a legacy. You came in because your grandpa worked there and your dad worked there. And now you, you, you were an intern and now you're working there. And here I come in a female off the street you know, flopping into this job. And it's, that was probably one of the biggest challenges I've had in my career because I was going against the grain in every single sense of the word, you know, coming into an organization like that. And that, you know, you, you think, when I think of challenges, that was one of the biggest ones because I can't change a culture that is in a Fortune 500 company that's been there from its existence. This is not going to happen. So let, let's let's talk about that. So you went um, after school, you where you you were uh, you majored in accounting, correct? You you didn't continue that very long, if at all, right? So so how, get get to um, you get into that a little bit and how you ended up in, in technology sales and then and then into marketing. Yes. So my first job out of college was you know keep keeping in mind it was a recession at the time, graduating had student loans, no parents to back me up. Like there was no family. My grandma had already passed and I was on, my mom had passed. I was on my own. Um, I had to get a job. So I went to account temps and they placed me at this small business, uh, which was a technology company. And I was supposed to be like filing papers and things like that for an acquisition that they had done. Um, Then they are desperate. So they had this new ERP software system and they, trained, let's say they had this guy named Jeff was another temp, trained me how to enter in orders, uh, like sales orders. Three days later, I retrained Jeff on how to do it properly because apparently <laughs> I loved software and I didn't know it. I mean, I just fell in love with this system. And my oh, job the way, there- I have, to, I have to interrupt and say that is the most Rebecca Gill thing I think you could possibly do. That I love software? No, that you 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 learned it from someone who you then retrained properly three <laughs> days later. So based on all of our um, interactions and working together, I think that your your path was pretty set early on. 
Oh, yes. Yes. Well, and like, you know, the funny thing was, is back then they didn't know any better. They gave me access to the full ERP system. I had access to their general ledger, the, account, the setup of the system. And it was a thousand screens. I'm like poking into everything and like figuring out what it was. And it was amazing to me how the data went from here to there and it controlled this national company. I thought the whole thing was just amazing. And because of that, I fell in love with it. And I ended up being their operations manager and, you know, and working there for over three years um, until one of their competitors came and tried to lure me away um, because I just fell in love with the software. And to me, it was truly amazing that, you know, to go from this helpless child who was in, lived in chaos to all of a sudden with software, I could move things all around the country and I could actually be responsible for shutting down Dell computers because they had no barcodes at, at the end of the production line and everything shut down. I mean, you know, it's just things like that that I thought, were, or I could be the hero and make sure the Department of Defense had their barcode so that they could keep running business. I mean, it was just, you know, it was amazing to me. And so that was, that was like my first job that I had out of college. And, you know, I learned a lot there because the, the constraints that you have with the situation that you're brought in like a temp doesn't mean anything. No one cared about my degree once I was in there, really. But, you know, my accounting principles and understanding basics of accounting were, were great. But nobody asked me my GPA. It was really how hard do you work and, you know, how well do you, can you take what you've learned and apply it to improve processes and things like that? And that was, that was a, a really good foundation for the rest of my career. So two things really jumped out at me just then. One is... Once again, you rose to the occasion of you know, being handed a responsibility you probably weren't qualified for, or oh, no. certainly, you know, uh, a, a company with a lot of oversight wouldn't have granted you that responsibility um, and power. But also, it wasn't how you came in; it's what you did when you got there, which led to your success in that role. And and that is such a powerful thing is mm -hmm. is because you 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 figured it out. You took ownership and accountability for your own success, sounds like, and didn't wait on anyone to hand it to you. No, and I thoroughly enjoyed it too. I mean, I absolutely loved that job for years. Um, and I would work 60, 70 hours a week, you know, and I got paid overtime and I, you know, which was also wonderful because I could help pay off my student loans, um, but I truly enjoyed it. And I, I, you know, I, but it, quite frankly, I think I actually love the software more than the job, which is how I ended up going to work for the software company who created, you know, who had created the software that we used. So, uh, so you changed jobs, right? You recruited out of that, out of that role. So the competitor, the, the competitor uh, recruited me for a sales position and I accepted it. And I had a non-compete at the time, which everybody else in the organization did when they left and they never went after anybody. Well, the company decided to sue me and go after me. So at like all of I don't know what I was, 26, 27, all of a sudden I was in court with a non-compete violation. Uh, and when asked, you know, why were they going after me, you know, brand new to, I'm young, right? I'm not going to a sales role. I don't know anything about sales. They said the answer was the vendor community really likes you when we consider that to be a threat. <laughs> That's a compliment. Which, a compliment. It was, but like, but that was, you know, that was a lot of stress and, you know, lesson learned from me, never sign one of those again, even though they never enforced it, like don't ever do that. But my saving, my savior was the software company came in and they said, we'll make this all go away. You know, your contract with us says we can't hire your employees. We'll hire her away from the competitor, takes the non-compete issue away and we'll make sure we pay her enough that she won't leave for a while. And they did. I mean, I doubled my salary overnight and then I got to work with the software that I loved and I stayed there for many years, uh, you know, and just was really, really happy. So your motivation at the time had nothing to do with financial gain, professional gain, you know, title, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Although you did end up, I think, with a, with a much greater title as you, as you made it, that move. Um, but it was really just love of what you were doing. And, and love for software, which is just, you know, I would never have guessed that you know, that that would, that would be part of my life, but it has followed me everywhere. Um, even into my alpaca, you know, world, that software, that love for software and ability to jump in has definitely just kind of grown with me.
Well, having worked with you, so we didn't talk about this at the beginning, but Rebecca and I met um, about a year and a half ago now, uh, which seems like a lot longer. Um, it, it really <laughs> I does. I you mean, like I, fungus. <laughs> I, no, no, no. In the way that I, I, it's it's uh, hard for me to um, stop and, and acknowledge that we've only known each other that long because we've we've yeah you know, we've done a lot of, together in that time. But Rebecca has been working um, as an SEO consultant and and guru and mentor and and at sometimes just absolutely the um, the the leader of a lot of things that we're doing um, in the marketing space. And when I think of what would what I would expect to make sense to you in in your um, a job that would be attractive and appealing is order. You know, you seem to like order. Um, and, and, you know, you call us out very quickly. We can you know, tend to be a little scattered and, and running in different directions. And, you know, you're very insistent that we keep um, everything centered. <laughs> yes. Go, yes. Get too distracted. So I definitely have um, OCD in my personality and struggle with it. And I'm a very linear thinker. I, you know, everything, like you said, has order and it has a path and a process that you go through, which is one of the reasons why I've always, you know, enjoyed SEO. Um, it's both a SEO meaning search engine optimization. It's both a puzzle, but it's also a very structured process when it's done right, uh, you know, that you go through and then you get to see the results. So you know, for that person that loves the thrill of the, you know, the hunt and sales and things like that, it's a, it's a very satisfying role because you get to work hard and you get to see your results. You may not see your results for two or four months, but you definitely get to see them. And just like going back to the day of, you know, when I, when I could manage that, the software in that company and move goods across the country and make an impact to like Dell computers, I learned with search engine optimization, I could control Google results. That was pretty amazing for a kid who grew up with so much outside of her control and living in chaos to, wow, I can actually control what shows up on page one of Google. Huh. I mean, it was like, it, you know, it's, it's, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why I graduate to it or, you know, gravitate to it because it is the sense of control that I've always seeked. Yeah. And from in chaos. a lot of ways I have it. You know, it's the opposite of, of what you, what was forced upon you. And, uh, you know, it's manifested perhaps in, <laughs> in that way, right? Whether conscious or, or otherwise, Yes. I really, I think that's a fascinating thing. And, and when I think of software, I think of order and objectivity um, as opposed to, you know, what has been most of my world uh, throughout my career as, as a salesperson, you know, very subjective, right? I mean, it's, you know, whether it's, unpredictable or um, just changes from minute to minute where you're, you're in a world that um, yeah, that's data driven now. And, and, and that's what you've taken to. Yeah. And, and, you know, even though, like I say, it's predict you, like you said, it's predictable. Google changes its algorithm like 12 times a day right now. I mean, it's completely ludicrous, but you just kind of got to write it out and, you know, understand that, you know, overall, you do know what's going on and there, you're, the process doesn't change. And, you know, I mean, there's, there is still that structure that no matter what chaos Google throws at you, you're still going to plug ahead and still going to do it. You know, you kind of work through, but you're right. Like software half the time doesn't work. It is chaotic, but that's okay. Well, I it's think just, what, yeah, what I, uh, we kissed a few frogs along the way in our marketing evolution uh, before we found you and we, uh, Everyone else was so focused on SEO as, in terms of the keywords and what it would generate, where our experience with you has been, while that's critical and you are our SEO go, um, guru, but you've always insisted that quality matters more than anything else mm -hmm. and, and, and made that point you know, very, very strongly, which, which is why it resonated with us because I cared significantly less about SEO and only about quality and the information that we were providing given you know, the critical nature of it, careers, jobs, livelihoods. And so it's been, I think, a really neat combination. So um, you know, your, your, your perspective on that is, is, is different and unique. And I think that's what made you, it makes you so much better than everyone else in what you well, do. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, no, you're, you know, you're probably not surprised to hear that, but everyone else needs to know that too. Who's listening. <laughs> so you're having a successful career um, working for you know, big companies. How did you make the decision ultimately to go out on your own? Was there a catalyst that led to that? Was it something you thought about doing for a while? 
No. So, you know, like growing up poor, I wanted health insurance. I wanted a place to live. I wanted, you know, food on my plate. So I would never have gone out on my own. Like that's not, I stayed at jobs for as long as I could, you know, I just, I just wouldn't have done that. That's too much risk for someone who has tried to mitigate risk her entire life. Um, but the situation changed at my job that I loved and I had been with them for, uh, I think like seven or eight years in total, um, and personnel changed. And I found myself in a very unhealthy environment and it was so unhealthy that I one day put myself in the ER for eight hours and they had, it took them eight hours to stabilize me. I'm a type one diabetic. And I was so preoccupied with this distress of what was going on. I mixed up my insulin. And if I hadn't gone to the ER right when I went and I waited like 15 more minutes, I probably would not have made it into the ER. Um, but I did, I got there stayed for eight hours uh, so they could stabilize me. And we, I went home and my husband just looked at him and he was like, we need some change. Like you have got to quit. And unfortunately it was again, a recession. He worked in automotive and automotive was the first hit with that recession. And we were hit really hard in the state of Michigan. We had no idea whether he was going to have a job the next day. And I remember, and there was no jobs. I watched LinkedIn all the time and there was no jobs on LinkedIn at that, you know, you know, like you could just see, like there was one page of job listings for what I would do. And that was it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what am I going to do? And the only option was try to go and create my own work. So I did. Cause I, I mean, I had to leave for my own physical health. Um, and so I just started, I created a website and I started to blog and, you know, share on social media. And I remember my husband back then going, how is this going to work? And I'm like, I, I think it'll work. How is it going to work? I'm like, I'm going to blog. I'm going to use social media. And he just remember looking at me like I was crazy. And I said, no, I, I think I'm going to do what I've, what I've done. And sure enough, you know, people in my old industry, because I didn't have a non-compete at any, at any point, were coming to me and started hiring me. And with, a, I think it was like six months, I was back to a six-figure salary working for myself. Which is, um, which is, you know, crazy in a number of, for a number of reasons. It, 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 <laughs> well, you did it during, you know, the, the housing market, you know, crash it, when, you know, being in staffing, I can tell you, no, you're right. No one was hiring. Mm-hmm. Tumbleweeds were blowing by, you know, back then. And, um, our phone rang all day, every day. Well, first it rang for a few months where we cringed every time because we knew it was going to be bad news from a client laying mm-hmm. off contractors. Um, and then, uh, our phone rang all day with candidates looking for jobs. And, and it was an awful time to um, the opposite of the time that we're in now, quite frankly, at, where we would just tell people, sorry, it we have nothing and we see nothing on the horizon. Mm-hmm. Um, being in technology, it, in IT staffing in particular, you know, IT projects get cut first. You know, anything that isn't mission critical gets put on the back burner. So you're being hired for things that weren't mission critical at that time, which is crazy (laughs) to me because it it, it just shows how valuable, you know, um, you were seen as someone who could deliver things for your clients or what, who was becoming your, your new clients, I guess, Mm -hmm. in a time where no one was spending money on anything like that. So they had seen the success that I had done with the former employer, you know, where they were nowhere to be found in Google. And we were on page one for like everything. And I had competed against Microsoft and Oracle and SAP and beat them on SEO. And, you know, we were showing up in articles and news magazines and, you know, getting awards and things like this. And they wanted that. Right. And they figured if I could do it for them, I could do it you know, for somebody else, which is accurate. You can, it's, you know, it's a formula that you just repeat and you tweak, you know, based on the company and the target demographic. Um, but I do feel very fortunate. And my, my husband's like, I cannot believe like you somehow you like slipped and fell into this big pile of pool poo and you came out smelling like roses. But, <laughs> you know, that was always what his joke was. Um, and, you know, that was back in 2009 and the agency's still going today and we still have, you know, clients and like, I, you know, I joke with with you and say, you'll get rid of me when you're done with me, right? There's, I don't have a long monthly contract or a long contracts, it's month to month. But I've had clients, you know, for seven, 11 years. <laughs> why, why do you think, so you were successful and are successful at, at your craft, clearly. But there's many others who try to do it. Um, most aren't 
nearly as good. You know that. I know that. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you're significantly better? What, what led to your success? I think one of the biggest things is I didn't chase money. Right. And I, you know, when a client's not a good fit or I don't think that I can help them, I never take them on. I say, you know, if I think the client's going in the wrong direction, I'll stand up and tell them no. And I'll refuse to do something if I know it's going to jeopardize, you know, the work that they, that we've done or the, their goals and their objectives. Uh, I think that's a big thing. And the fact that I'm willing to walk away, I have fired clients that wouldn't listen, that were doing things that were damaging and, you know, or just I've departed from people where I said, like, this isn't working. You know, we're, you're not going to get the return on your investment. Here's the reasons why. And it just like, I don't want your money because I only want people that are going to be happy with the results. And I think that's a huge, huge difference with the people I compete with um, to be able to walk away. And, you know, maybe that goes back to when I was 11 and I just walked away from home and, you know, on Christmas morning, I don't know, but it's, it's what, why I say I don't, I try to mitigate risk. I absolutely do, but I'm also completely okay with taking hard stances when it needs to be done. And that's whether it's myself or with clients. So what, well, yeah, this podcast is, is going to be, you know, as we do more episodes and this is early on, but I'm really quickly becoming enamored with the the concept of success how it's achieved something i've always thought a lot about but my perspective has changed i mentioned this in in the introductory episode that i did that i i really did used to associate with 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 financial success but it it, that happiness word that came up again right you just mentioned it really is an individual thing and it, it means something different to everyone but i do think there's some recurring themes that um I'm going to encounter at least that that's my working theory that's that's unfolding right now and one of them is confidence in being able to know what you don't want to do don't like to do aren't willing to do mm-hmm. as much as what you think you want to do um, because you have to figure that out along the way too and that's what you just described in terms of you know, the business that you weren't willing to take because it wasn't a good fit yeah and i think success and happiness changes over time right? Like what I would have considered to be successful in my twenties, you know, and in my thirties and in my forties and in my fifties, where I am now has definitely shifted. You know, you like when you're in your twenties, at least for me, I wanted health insurance. I wanted, you know, a solid paycheck. I wanted to feel wanted and needed at my job. And I wanted to do a good job, right. As opposed, and then I get into my thirties and it's like, okay, now I've got kids. I need a job that can be a little bit flexible and, you know, so I don't miss out on their thing, you know, there's, it just kind of shifted. And then I get to my forties and now I'm working for myself. Heck man, if I want on Fridays and take the day off and go up to my cottage for the weekend, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to work for my cottage if I want to for the entire week with my kids, you know, and now I'm to my fifties and I work part-time in consulting and I work part-time on the farm. That's happiness for me because that's balance, you know, to the life that I have. It creates a lot of Um, where I've always wanted structure that that farm life brings in the unknown. As you said, I've got three babies coming to it. It could pop out at any time, Uh, but it it just, it's like, there's like a new equilibrium to my life and to the stage of my life. Um, And I think it also, my personality is I can get really heads down. Like I've missed client meetings because I'm heads down on a task and I totally forget about the call you know, that's, that's the way I am. And having like that farm life stops me from doing that. And it creates a little bit more balance where I just, you know, it's my personality not to have it. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough thing. I mean, Dave, has that been an, an interesting adjustment I, uh, where you have to switch back and forth? You know, I think of when I go on vacation, if I'm actually on vacation and not, and not working, it's hard for me to get back into that work mode. I think your, your mind, your body, you yeah. physically, I don't, I don't know the, you know, uh, the biology behind it, but I think it's real. And it, it, your life kind of goes back and forth, which I, I, I don't know that most people could do. <laughs> could do well, what you're so doing right I used to be like you. I used to go on vacation for seven days and I could be in Jamaica at an all inclusive resort. And it would take me two days to settle myself down and just kind of disconnect from work and stop worrying about everybody's problems and, 
You know, I mean, I still have, if something happens with a client, I'm up at three o'clock in the morning worrying about it and wanting to go fix it, right? This without question. However, having part-time digital and part-time analog, you know, with the farm has made that go away. I don't, because I'm not all encompassly including, you know, thrown into the, the digital job. I, I don't have that issue of disconnecting anymore. And it's really, it's gotten very easy for me to bounce back and, you know, between the, between the two, which is really important at this stage in my life, because that is part of my, you know, that's what I need to be happy. Um, which, like I said, is far different than what in the 20, you know, my twenties, my twenties, I wanted to be all in, in, in encompassed in my job. I, you know, I wanted to live and breathe my job because that was security and, consistency, you know, it was, it, pro it provided consistency that I didn't have growing up and I really liked it and, you know, and I enjoyed it. Um, now I'm like, no, I don't really need that anymore. I'm okay. <laughs> well, the security is, is huge. When you didn't have it, mm -hmm. you've, you achieved it and, it and you're able to change your outlook as a result. I, I think, you know, you're in a fortunate position to be able to do that. And one that I, I expect most people, whether they realize it or not, are, are striving to get there. Um, where money, while, while sh you know, it shouldn't be the top thing someone chases, it has to be part of the conversation. It has to be relevant because to me, money represents options. You oh, know, absolutely. Money you have, the more options you have. And, and those with, you know, who have no money haven't figured out how to, um, uh, to earn enough yet to have those options. It's a tough, it's a tough life. And, and so when I'm speaking to anyone young about their career, yeah, it, it'd be remiss if I didn't interject that into the conversation, because while you may want to go and and just you know be on the beach all day, you know, selling selling ice cream, you know, from from person to person, you know, I, I don't know if that's actually a thing anyone does, but you, you have to be able to make a certain income eventually in order to have any kind of options as life goes on. And so the blend of all these things, you, you just can't separate them. Um, I, I've learned. And so, you know, as your career you know, progressed, as your agency you know, achieved success, you were able to start living the life you wanted, but you had to work for it. You had to earn it first. Oh, absolutely. But my husband and I both, right. My husband retired at 47, I think it was 47 or 48 from automotive and he works on the farm and trust me, it's not a full-time job. His work on the farm, <laughs> But you know that was working hard in our 20s and our 30s and our 40s and contributing to our 401ks, you know, to making sure that we've got savings. I mean, we have a good savings for retirement. That's how he could retire early. You know, it was chasing those promotions at the time um, and having that balance between happiness now or I mean, we were happy, but you know, sacrificing things early on in life and making sure that you've got yourself set up so you can do what you want later in life. Other people want to be able to have complete freedoms when they're twenties and in their thirties. And then, you know, everybody's got to find that balance for them and what makes them happy. But I would tell like, you know, listeners to this, um, especially if you're young in your career, you know, like be introspective, know who you are, know what you are now and, you know, and what you might want to be later in life and make sure the decisions that you're making and the careers that you're, you know, the path that you're, you're, you're putting yourself on are going to support that both now and in the future. And I think that that's important. And for the love of God, start co contributing to your 401k at the very first job. Like don't ever not do that. No, no doubt. Com yeah. Compounded interest is a, is a powerful thing. So, so make sure you're taking advantage yes. of that. But what you said is so important uh, so I want to reiterate it and make sure I got the, 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 the main point from it, which is know where you want to end up, right? Yeah. You know, try to figure that out as soon as possible and then, and then work to, to, to get there because, um, it, it happens for everyone at, at different times in different ways. But, uh, I think if you keep that focus in mind and like you said, lower your time preference, right? Don't discount the future you know, for today. And, and that is such an important thing that I've learned as my life has gone on. Um, is it, uh, yeah, I have to take care of the moment, but I should always be doing that with an eye on tomorrow. Am I taking care of what I want today for today? Or am I taking care of it tomorrow? And tomorrow should always you know, be considered in, in anything oh, you do. Absolutely. Like, you know, for us, 
Um, you know, both my parents are gone. They didn't ever see anywhere close to like a retirement, not even anywhere near it, right? My husband's father died in his early 50s. He didn't get to have his retirement, you know? And it's like, do we want to like work forever and wait until we're 65 to enjoy retirement and, you know, what we consider the golden years? Or do we want to do things now? And, you know, having the alpaca farm for us is part of doing it now. You know, we don't want to like wait forever, you know, for, for those types of things. We want to incorporate it into our life now. And that was one of the reasons why my husband retired early. We moved out of the city and we moved in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't know enough how he spends his day, but I do know from you, you're, you're very accessible. You know, um, you know, when we're working together, I know you put in, you know, lots of hours um, on, on digital marketing and with your clients that you have now, but it also seems like you are very busy on weekends. You're, you, you know, you talk about driving out of state with the alpacas, you, you have, you host um, big events on the farm. So I, I bet if you added it all up, you work a whole lot more than a full-time job today. I do. So. I mean, I, yeah, because I have a retail store that I'm in Friday, Saturday, and Sunday right now. We do tours on the farm. Um, you know, we have like the big brothers and big sisters and do events for them, you know, things like that, as well as like you said, go to New York and pick up a bunch of alpacas and bring them back. And um, we, we do the 4-H program for kids and things like that. It does all work, right? But it is also, um, there's a difference between doing something that you hate and doing something that you enjoy, you know, and, and having like, I enjoy SEO. I enjoy working with clients. I only keep clients. I like, you know, I only have clients that I like. I'm clearly, I like you, I, you know, I'll, I'm encouraging you to do more and more as opposed to trying to, you know, limit you down. Well, who doesn't, um, who doesn't Rebecca? Yeah. Who doesn't like you, but I mean, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I'll give you a list later. It's, it's liking what you do and enjoying what you do that doesn't make it seem like I'm working 50 hours a week because even like last night it's eight o'clock I'm printing out labels because we have shearing of our alpacas in a day and it's the first time I've had to do it and I should have had it done two weeks ago you know but it just needs to get done but I don't mind it because I do enjoy what I do and I've made conscious decisions to get to this point in my life and in my career you know and just life in general and it's okay. Like, I, I don't mind it. And that, you know, that is like the true sense of happiness, I would say, you know, when you can spend 10 hours a day being busy and you don't get to sit down till like eight o'clock at night. And if you look back at your day and your day's good, that's a good day to me. That's a good day. Yeah. I tell you know, my kids and I would tell any young person this, that the goal should be to find something you'd wake up and do whether there's money involved or not. Back, yes. back to that because, um, and, and then it doesn't feel like work. It, it certainly doesn't feel like a job and that you can just immerse yourself in and that's how you're going to be the best at whatever it is you're doing or the best that you can be at that is to, is to wake up thinking about it, go to bed thinking about it, not because you're worrying, but because you're enthusiastic and you know, you know I talk about this, we talk about this all the time. I discovered marketing only about four years ago after ignoring it if for my entire career and ignoring it for the first 13 years um, with Four Corner Resources, our, st our staffing company, where our website was five pages and I would say you know, stupid things oh. like, what the heck do you put on a staffing company website? There's only so many words to use to describe it. Um, naive to say the least, but I discovered it not even looking for it, but looking to do new things. I was you know, spending, you know, and I still do today. How do we improve the business? How do we evolve? How do we do things no one else is doing? How do we serve our clients better? And through those, that constant effort, it took me a long time to, to end up with, you know, finally getting to marketing on the list of, of different things. And I absolutely have fallen in love with it. And it is the thing I, I think about at night and in the morning when I'm not with my family or, or friends. And I, I wish that feeling for everyone. Like I want everyone to know what that feels like, you know, specifically my kids, um, as uh, obscure as it may be, right? Whatever it is, whether you want to research, you know, um, you, you want to, you know, people will say things like, don't get, you know, don't major in history. There's no money in that. Well, who cares if, if you want to dev devote your life to, you know, reading historical texts or knowing about some, again, maybe obscure part of history and become an expert in it and know everything about it. Like to me, that, that should be the goal. 
worry about how you're going to make money later. Um, you know, just, just, just try to be the absolute best version of yourself you can be with something. And, and I, think, I think things tend to take care of themselves. I wish you would have told me that when I was 20 and in college. Well, I, I'm trying to make, I did I not go that path. Well, I wasn't told that. And, and I don't think many of us, anyone our age was told that, you know, we were told get a job, right. Or I, you didn't even have to tell you that it's, it's out. Yeah. You, know, you were, <laughs> you just knew you had to get a job because you had bills to pay. Yeah. And I think of that particular phrase now as sort of a demoralizing thing to say to a young person, right. Don't just get a job, like find something that you are willing to sacrifice time you know, spent you know, doing other things. So find yeah. something that you're willing to immerse yourself in. Again, st don't study it, learn it, and you know, uh, just you know, dive into it, whatever the it is. And I think that um, it should be the goal, even if it means living in your car for six months and sweeping floors to pay the bills while you're you know, working for free somewhere as a volunteer to learn that thing, whatever it is. Like we should all be so lucky to find that and you know, took me almost 50 about. years. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that's the word, right. Which I was so dismissive of for early on in, in my career is like nah, passion, be passionate about things outside of work. Well, sure. But if you can combine the two, that's, that is powerful. Well, think about it this way. You like how many of your hours per week, per month, per year, do you spend at your job? Right. It's a huge portion of your life and you want it to be something that you enjoy. I mean, back in college and in high school, I loved psychology and I would have loved to have gone into psychology. I still love it today, but I didn't because I was worried about having the ability to get a job in the recession. So I became an accountant. I hate accounting. Like I'm never going to do account. I mean, I don't even do my own taxes. I hire someone to do my taxes, right? Because I hate it. I don't want to do it. It's boring to me. I wish back, you know, if I could go back and talk to myself back then, I would have told myself, go get that, go get that psychology degree and know somehow it'll work itself out. Even if you have to wait tables after college till you can find the right job, right? Go do that. Um, and I didn't. So what do I do? I try to bring psychology into my life, which is into the marketing world that I do with the digital. I use psychology with my alpacas and behavior modification and the sales process and everything else, because I didn't follow what I was passionate about back then. Um, and, you know, and if you're like 20 listening to this, like reevaluate what you truly are passionate about, because like Pete said, you, you want to be able to proactively with enthusiasm and excitement, think about what you do for work uh, and how you make money, because that's how you will have happiness. And it's how you're going to be successful. You can't be successful at something you stink and hate. There's just no way. Like it's, it's a grind to go. Like if you, you know, this is always kind of my rule. Like if Sunday comes and I'm dying because I have to go back to work on Monday and like I'm dreading every moment until I walk into that office or open up my computer, that's a problem. Like nobody should live like that. And if you can make change, pivot till you can find, you know, what you are passionate about and spend your time doing that. And, and that point you just made, I'm glad you did because I, I was going to mention it. It's okay if you hear that statement and don't know even where to begin it just mm -hmm. be active in your pursuit of finding it right don't you, know, you and can, open right open to yes. possibilities but don't sit back and wait right um if if you don't feel that you're on the path to where you want to well if you don't know where you want to end up you have to get out and experience more things make changes um especially while you're young because as life goes on your, and your responsibilities grow, your, um, your flexibility is limited. And, and so that's yeah. why it's such an important message for young people. And too often they get the wrong one, in my opinion, of being told to grow up fast and get a job. We want, I'm encouraging responsibility. I'm encouraging accountability, but I'm encouraging as much as anything else, exploration of, of figuring out what will motivate you over time what is your long-term goal and uh, and to you know don't confuse activity and actions with results results will come if the action is high i mean i one of my kids you know right now is expressed to me recently one of my um college students uh who, who said I, I don't know what my thing is yet i'm like that's okay keep fine you have time you're 20 years old um mm -hmm. and 
I think he said something along the lines of, well, yeah, but I don't want to be 24 and not know. I'm like, why not? Who cares? It's just an age. As long as you, you know, it doesn't matter when you find it. All I expect of you is to keep trying and, and to put forth, forth your best effort. And, and I'm confident that it'll come. So, um, you know, it's a work in progress, you know, until it doesn't need to be anymore. Mm-hmm. So you, you said something that I was going to ask you, so, but I, I'll rephrase it a little bit. You said, if you could go <laughs> back and talk to 20 year old Rebecca, but what if you could, Right. What if you had that time machine? It's a question that I always think of for myself, and I, I, I like to ask people in interviews, what would you say? Would you really say, given everything you know now, given where you are now, would you really say go pursue psychology? I would. You would. Knowing, would. knowing right now that that would take you down a completely different path, you wouldn't yes. probably be where you are now. I okay. absolutely would. I mean, like I'm a highly sensitive person. I'm a room watcher right? I can't help but watch a room and watch everybody's expressions and process what that means and think about it and, you know, use that. I'm, I'm very empathetic. Um, I, which is funny because I used to think I wasn't, and now I realize I'm to a fault, um, you know, in, in, in various ways, but, and I, and I want to, I want, I want to do good for people, right? I want to, I want to help people. That's just part of my, I want to take care of people. It's part of my nature, you know, whether that's always been who I am or my early childhood with a sick mom made me, you know, kind of open to that. But all of that leads to like psychology and, you know, the fascinating, and I find the brain fascinating and, you know, there's just so much. Um, I wish I would have done that and I don't have a regret for not doing it, but if I could go back, I would encourage myself to, to take that path and give myself that time for that exploration, at least to get the degree, you know, to see if you really did like it and, you know, not just go into something that you really don't like. Um, And the funniest thing is, you know, back in college, the accounting students and the marketing students were always like in the same areas of our college. And the marketing kids were the ones that flunked out of the accounting classes. (laughs) That was like their step down that they took and the path that they went because it was easier classes. And, you know, I look back at that and I was like, I would have probably really enjoyed the marketing classes back then, even though at the time, you know, I kind of looked my nose down to them, but knowing now that it intersects with psych or intertwines with um, psychology a lot, I probably would have really, really liked it. And that may have been my path had I allowed myself to explore it, which I didn't. And I, you know, I, I wish I would have done that as well. Maybe, except that back then the marketing classes consisted of like how to sell, you know, why the logo on Camel cigarettes is what yeah. it is and how to, uh, <laughs> to get people to Yeah, it would be a little them. bit different than what it is today. But I mean, and I can't go back and I can't change what I did, but I can encourage others that I talk to, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's young professionals um, that want mentoring or it's my own children to, you know, really follow what you want to do. My 16-year-old son is very adamant about going to get a degree and coming back and running the farm. And we keep telling him, you know, we'd love for you to do that, but it's okay to not do that too. If you want to go and, you know, to have a career in an office or you want to be a welder or a plumber or an electrician, like, you know, we don't care what that is as long as you're ha- you find something that you are happy doing and that you don't dread to go to work every day. Yeah, um, I, th- I think that people who found it, um, and are comfortable with where they are, give that advice more genuinely. So you said you're empathetic and I, I just think you're genuine, uh, you know, as much as anything else, you are always going to say what you believe and, and mean. <laughs> and, um, and we need more of that. We, you know, we need more of that in the world, a lot more. Um, so I think those things are tied together because I think by, by default, that is being empathetic, even if at times it's, it's, you know, this saying things that need to be said for, for someone's own good, even if they don't want to hear it in the moment. So I, yeah, I, I would I mean, expect that's how you parent, just it, knowing it you. is right. Yeah. And, but again, it's also, I think to, um, being okay with the consequences, right? I mean, you have to be okay with the consequences to be able to allow yourself to be able to say that. And some people just don't have that personality, um, you know, or that experience that allows them to do it. And I'm thankful that I can, because I think it served me well. And I think it served my clients well too. So you, you like psychology. I like sociology. That was a course that uh, I took towards the end of my senior year. Cause the kids that flunk, flunked out of business school, went into marketing. The ones that flunked out of marketing went to social sciences where I was. 
<laughs> so I was a poli sci major, but the sociology class that I took was fascinating to me. And yeah, you know, if I um, you know, at the point where I don't need to work anymore, I will probably go back and and pursue you know, potentially an advanced degree there because I'm so fascinated by that. And one of the things that um, I think we, the world needs a lot more of is, is I think of success and how it's achieved and how young people can pursue it um, is you know, don't be afraid to be vulnerable along the way. When you mentioned consequences, if you're going to be truly honest in your words and your messaging, then you have that takes a level level of vulnerability that most people don't want to display right now. And I think social media has been a big part of that because all we see is how great everything is when day to day life is tough. It's challenging. It's frustrating. So uh, you're at a good place now because you had to climb the mountain, right? You didn't just arrive on top of it where you wouldn't be necessarily happy or appreciative of what you have. I'm so thankful that social media was not around as I climbed that mountain. Right. I mean, it was hard enough as a kid seeing the other kids that seemed to have everything that I didn't, you know, and then like, you know, coming out of college and those kids that were going to the good jobs already at the, you know, big five accounting firms or big six, whatever it was back then, or parents, you know, I mean, those like, and you, you just kind of go through your life. We didn't have as much visibility to the utopia that everybody presents on social media. Um, and my heart, like that, that empathetic part of me just feels so bad for today's youth and those early in their career who are on all of those social media channels because that's what they see and it's so unrealistic where I say don't race to the bottom like that's you know social media puts you in a place where you want to race to the unrealistic it doesn't exist you know that that image that everybody puts out there and I wish people would I don't want to have a bunch of Debbie Downers on social media but I would wish it was it was a lot more real so that everybody who's using it would see the reality of everyone else's lives and not just the sugar coated version that, you know, is placed out there. Yeah, I mean, go, you know, go figure. No, no one's putting all their failures um, on social media uh, as, as a rule. They're, they're putting, as, as we know, the phrase goes, their highlight reel. And for for young people, I think it creates that. Um, that time preference problem again that we mm -hmm. talked about where you want instant gratification and you want what others have and just know that it comes, you can, yes, you could get lucky. You could beat the odds. You could be that one in a million, you know, social media influencer who gets to, you know, live life like Jake Paul and run around and, and have fun. But um, don't, if you happen to become that great, but don't rely on that. And I would, would guarantee, or I would be bet that you, you know someone like a, a Jake Paul. I'm not sure if you know who that is. I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, yeah, he's a big YouTuber, and and he, and he and he does all kinds of crazy stuff. Seems like a pretty good guy too. Uh, so I enjoy watching him. I'm probably at my age shouldn't even know who he is, but um, <laughs> uh, he, uh, um, I bet that guy outworks everyone else too. Oh, you know, I bet he works 24 seven and, you know, we get to see the fun stuff, but, um, you know, I, I would have to, to bet anyone who rises to that level of success. Uh, I, if I knew how to make it easy and quick, I would do it. And, um, and, and it sounds like you, uh, you don't, you, you don't know how that path would go either. Right. Mm -mm. So with all of that said, have you found career Zen? I would say yes. I would say yes. And the reason I would say yes is because I don't think of tomorrow like, oh, here's what I want. Like, you know, if I could only have this, if I can only get to this, right? I'm actually like the place in my life where I am happy with what I do. I get to have both sides of my personality. You know, I have the digital world where I can help people and I can have the puzzle that I want to work on you know, with SEO and search and that type of thing. And it satisfies that part of my personality. But on the other side, I still have the alpaca farm and I get to immerse myself with animals on a daily basis. And we get to just have wonderful people come in that we meet along the way. Um, and I wouldn't change, I really wouldn't change much. And, you know, if you, if you, if Pete, if you said to me, like, Rebecca, you get to change tomorrow. How is tomorrow going to be? It could be anything that you want. How is it going to be different than what you have today? I 
don't know what that would be. I, I, I don't have a good answer for you. And maybe you would have a good employee at the farm that I could, you know, have do stuff so that I'm not having to be around every weekend, but that would probably be the only change. And that doesn't, that doesn't lead to me to being able to say, I haven't found my career's end. Cause I really think that I have. Well, that is admirable. Um, you know, I think for many that's enviable, but it should as much as anything else be motivational to, you know, hear a story from someone who had a lot of things stacked against her from an early age, um, over, overcame it. Um, and, and, you know, with many, many years to go, right. You're, you're still young, um, by, by, uh, by my standards for sure. I say that because you're I'm the a, same age. I'm a few months <laughs> older than you. I think. Um, and, uh, um, you know, you've, you've, you've achieved that happiness. You've achieved that career Zen and, um, and that's awesome. And I know you've, you deserve it because you've, you've worked so hard for it and being who you are and what you've done has led to that. So, um, if you don't mind, I'd love to get a couple of videos of alpacas to share on, on our show notes, because if, if you're listening, as I've seen some pictures and a couple of videos, um, and we'll put the information, uh, the website to Cotton Creek Farms. I believe that is, uh, that is where everyone could find out about the alpacas and go to your store uh, from there if you want to buy alpaca gifts. Um, that, this is me. Rebecca doesn't know I'm going to say that. I love it. I, I, um, I think... Uh, I, I would love an alpaca one day myself. I just need to figure out where to keep it. So we'll, we'll get you there. You don't keep it in your house. No, but I have a fence. I have a fence yard. So yeah, no, no, not, 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 not in Orlando, Florida. They're technically level. Well, yes. Not in Orlando, Florida. And they're technically livestock and, you know, need some land. All right. When I, when I go to Montana, need their own kind of Zen and it's not Orlando, Florida's backyard. No. All right. Well, I'll get I'll get I'm not, I'm not, you're a little bit ahead of me. I'm not quite there yet, but uh, I'll, 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 I'll get out in the middle of nowhere soon enough, hopefully. But thank you so much for doing this. Um, I uh, have really enjoyed the conversation. I've learned a few things along the way too that I didn't know about you. So that's been awesome. And um, you know, if, if anyone has any, any questions or follow up, you can contact us at questions at zengig.com. We'd love to hear from you for future show ideas, but otherwise have a great rest of your day. And Rebecca, thanks so much. You are welcome.